we come together today, acknowledging that we share this land with the Wurundjeri people, the people of the Boonwurrung and Boorong people, rather, Wurundjeri is where I live. <laughs> and we pay our respect to their elders past, present and emerging. We acknowledge they've cared for this land for generations and we are thankful for that care. And we commit ourselves towards the work of reconciliation with our First Peoples. So today, during the course of the last week, we have had Ascension Day on Thursday, a time when we recognise the reality that Jesus came and broke into this world and that through his resurrection, we particularly see the breaking in of God's kingdom. And yet, as we think about the Ascension, we recognise that God's kingdom is here and yet not fully realised. And we live in that sense of hope and anticipation of Jesus' return and of the full inbreaking of God's kingdom. Let's hear some verses from Psalm 1 as we begin our worship. Blessed are those who delight in the law of the Lord, who meditate on it night and day. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in season, and their leaves do not wither. In all they do, they grow and flourish. Let us pray. Eternal God, ascended Lord, the pioneer of our salvation, we cry out in praise and thanksgiving in response to your loving kindness, in response to the ways you have held us and guided us, enfolded us with your grace. We give you thanks for the presence of the risen Lord Jesus with us for the way in which he dispels doubts and awakens faith. We praise you for the wonder of the ways in which you care for us so deeply. We praise you, O oh God, that you are the same yesterday, today and forever, that you are not limited by time and space. We give thanks and praise for Jesus' preparedness to show us your true nature and your character. Thank you that his presence disclosed a new reality at work within this world, the reality of your kingdom, O oh God, where what was broken is mended and what is reflected is relieved, where what is bound is set free and what is excluded becomes included. Help us, O oh God, to catch a stronger vision of your kingdom, to hear the resonance of your voice and to experience the reality of your spirit with us. We thank you, O oh God, for one another, for those who shared our journeys with us in significant ways. Thank you for the ways you bless and challenge and encourage us through each other. A merciful God, we are aware of the limits of our own love for you and for others. We are aware that Jesus has showed us the values of your kingdom and that they are so different to this world and yet so often we tend to follow the values of the world around us. Forgive us, O Lord, when we fail to live as children of your kingdom. Forgive us when we are slow to obey you, when we fail to listen to you. Forgive us, O oh God, when we fail to give of ourselves to others, when we become too preoccupied with our own plans and ideas. Search our hearts, O oh God, and cleanse and renew us by your spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Jesus invites us to dwell with him and in him and he tells us that we have already been cleansed by the word that he has spoken to us so we hear and believe the good news that in jesus christ our sins are forgiven and we are thankful amen we're going to sing together a, an old uh, methodist hymn that speaks of our gratitude to god and our wonder at god's great love to us and can it be thank you now we are using masks if you have one while we're singing
we're going to listen to our Bible reading today, which comes from Acts chapter 8. Thanks. Heather's filling lots of roles for us today. Unfortunately, David's not. David's back's playing up for him, so Heather's kindly filling in on music as well. Thank you. The reading this morning is from Acts chapter 8, verses 26 to 40. Philip and the Ethiopian official. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, get ready and go south to the road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. So Philip got ready and went. Now an Ethiopian eunuch, who was an important official in charge of the treasury of the queen of Ethiopia, was on his way home. He had been to Jerusalem to worship God and was going back home in his carriage. As he rode along, he was reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Holy Spirit said to Philip, go over to that carriage and stay close to it. Philip ran over and heard him reading the book of the prophet of Isaiah. He asked him, do you understand what you are reading? The official replied, how can I understand unless someone explains it to me? And he invited Philip to climb up and sit in the carriage with him. The passage of scripture which he was reading was this. He was like a sheep that is taken to be slaughtered, like a lamb that makes no sound when its wool is cut off. He did not say a word. He was humiliated and justice was denied him. No one will be able to tell about his descendants because his life on earth has come to an end. The official asked Philip, tell me of whom is the prophet saying this, of himself or someone else? Then Philip began to speak. Starting from this passage of scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. As they travelled down the road, they came to a place where there was some water. And the official said, here is some water. What is to keep me from being baptised? The official ordered the carriage to stop. And both Philip and the official went down into the water. And Philip baptised him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord took Philip away. The official did not see him again, but continued on his way, full of joy. Philip found himself in Assetus. He went on to Caesarea, and on the way he preached the good news in every town. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God amongst us, for the word of God within us, we give thanks. As I look back over my life, I'm really thankful for all the people that have shared in that journey with me. And I'm sure you're similarly thankful for those that have shared with you. I remember in primary school having a couple of friends who were really loyal and accepting and they were really helpful. In my teenage years, there was a minister who helped me to understand and to recognize and respond to Jesus Christ and to have my life transformed by him and to help me in that early stage of growth as a Christian. When I was in my early 20s, there was a lady who I met who helped me to understand a bit more of the work of the Holy Spirit and being open to that in my life. Later on, there was a group of friends who helped me when I was approaching adulthood and embracing my own individuality, moving towards marriage, moving towards having a family. And then there was a different group that came alongside me when I was raising my family and during the process of experiencing widowhood and then the loss of my parents and throughout other experience of that particular phase of life. But then there were some times too when there didn't seem to be terribly many people that I was terribly close to. 
And then there are other times when other groups of companions came alongside, others that shared my journey, that helped me in my faith in God. In more recent times, those that shared times of joy and times of grief, those that companioned with me during my candidating as a minister and my process of training. And now, of course, I'm sharing this journey with you and you with me. The story we read today about Philip is about a journey, Philip and this Ethiopian eunuch, both on journeys. Philip was one of those characters that we read of from time to time in the Gospels, but we read most about him in that particular chapter from Acts. He was one of the 12 apostles. He journeyed with Jesus and his name pops up from time to time in different stories in small ways. You may remember a while back, we looked at the story of Nathaniel and Philip was the one there who encouraged Nathaniel to encounter Jesus for himself, to see for himself what Jesus was like. At another point in the Gospels, the Greeks come to Jesus and want to, a group of Greeks, and want to see him. And it's Philip that they go to. So he seems to have been a very approachable sort of man and one who is keen to introduce people to Jesus. He was one of the early deacons and we hear that he was keen to share the good news of Jesus. He shared it with some people in Samaria before this story. And then in his latter life, we hear that he continued to do that and his daughters were prophets in the early church. Interesting that we have this record of some young females who had a particular role in the early church. So Philip in this story was led by an angelic messenger to leave Samaria and his journey was to go towards Gaza. And interestingly, it just says he got up and went. God spoke to him and he went. Sometimes our lives take those sort of sharp turns and for him, this was a turn in his journey. Many years ago, I nursed an elderly lady who was dying of cancer. She had sensed a call to become a missionary when she was 54 years old. And she went for the first time as a missionary to Papua New Guinea, where she served for 16 years together with her two sisters. They were certainly the oldest missionaries that group had ever authorised to go overseas at that point in time. Prior to that, they operated a drapery store. While they were in this mission process, they ran a children's home. There were three single women and it was an amazing change. It can be courageous to take those sorts of changes, can't it, in life. To change our direction takes courage. Even just to change our ideas about issues takes a degree of courage and humility. Or to change our habits takes courage and persistence. But whatever stage in life we're at, sometimes we're called to make those sorts of radical changes. As Philip goes on, we see that he gets closer to this man. And when he can see him up ahead, the story tells us that he ran towards this man, this unnamed Ethiopian eunuch. We don't often hear about people running to obey God in the scripture. We hear about them running to disobey, but not so much running to obey. But he recognised there was an urgency about what he should do. And so he responded in a timely fashion and he moved on quickly. I'm grateful that along the pathway of my life, while I was in that process of working towards um, the process of candidating, one of the companions along my way uh, pointed out to me a painting by Caravaggio. It's the painting of the call of Matthew. And as Cara, in the picture, as Jesus beckons to Matthew, you can see that Matthew looks like, who, me? Should I be doing this? Are you really calling me? And looks quite stunned. But one of the details that I'd never noticed that was pointed out to me, and it's quite hard to see, but in the, the feet in the picture, if you look at the feet of Jesus, they're actually already moving, walking straight ahead. So there's this sense where Matthew's being called, but Jesus isn't hanging about. He needs to respond and get going. That picture came to me at a time when it was pretty clear I needed to respond and get going, and I'm grateful that it was pointed out to me. 
Sometimes we can spend too long just contemplating when we need to take the next step in the journey. Now, to the people of Israel, this guy from Ethiopia was from the most remote part of the world from their perspective. They saw that as the ends of the earth. And so in the context of Acts, it resonates with the call of Jesus to the disciples to say they were to take this message to the ends of the earth. Being a eunuch, he would have been ostracised in many ways and ridiculed often. His non-gender conforming status would have been a problem to people round about him. Yet somewhat surprisingly, he has got a hold of the scriptures of Israel and the prophet Isaiah, and he's reading those scriptures. And also, he's taken such an interest in this God of the Israelites that he's made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, to the temple, and that's where he was coming from in his journey. However, the problem with his journey was that when he came to that temple, he would not have been allowed to enter because he was a eunuch. And of course, he would never have been allowed to enter because of that status. After this experience of permanent exclusion in a way from this aspect of the faith of Israel, he's reading this scroll, so he's still interested and he encounters Philip. And he invites Philip to come up and join him and share the journey with him and explain what these scriptures mean. Philip does it, so he obviously ignores some of the customary barriers of ethnicity and sexuality and sits with him and he accepts the man's hospitality and seeks to connect with him. It says he starts with that passage, so he looks at what he's looking at and he tries to make this connection with him. And from there, he shares the story of Jesus with him. And the man's life has changed. It's a little reminiscent of the story we often read around this time, that story of the two people on the road to Emmaus and them encountering the resurrected Jesus and Jesus explaining the scriptures to them, explaining that story and their lives being transformed by that encounter. There's something powerful and life-giving about sharing together around scripture. A number of us have done that over the Lenten period. Some are continuing to do it in some small groups at this point in time. Philip shared with this man and it was a helpful experience for them both. It helped them to see what Jesus was saying to him. It was a powerful and life-giving experience. I began today by talking about a variety of people who've had an impact on my life. And I'm sure you know so many people in your own lives. And in fact, you may have been thinking of those while I was describing my journey. In looking at our journeys, it's helpful for us to see what these people have meant to us and how they've related to us. It challenges us to think of who is it that we are journeying with at this point in our life. Who are we sitting alongside? Who are we helping? Can we identify some people who really need somebody else to be sitting alongside them at the moment? Someone to move closer and to be helpful and to be a companion through this part of their journey. It challenges us about who we're sharing Jesus with, who we have those conversations with about our faith in God. And it reminds us of the great value of getting together around scripture and how we benefit from that and of the opportunities we have to do that, both within our congregation and in other places. Their journey is almost complete for these two, but as they were going along, the man's response to Philip is strong. His response to Jesus is strong. He embraces this God that Philip has talked about and asks to be baptised. And he is, from what we can see straight away. No process of preparation. They just go and do this. And in that process of being baptised, he's welcomed into the family of God, the same as everybody else. His status, his ethnicity makes no difference. He's one of the body of Christ. And for the early church, this would reinforce how important it was that they take this message of the gospel to everyone that there was no one who should be excluded 
that all were welcome. As the story comes to its conclusion, we read that Philip was snatched away quite abruptly. So he couldn't linger in this lovely little experience that he'd had there. He was taken off somewhere else to do some other work in the cause of the gospel. And sometimes those things we've been doing come to an end and it's time to move on and do something else to engage in the work of God in our communities. The eunuch we read at the end of the story was filled with joy and continued on his journey. Lots of those special experiences in faith that we have fill us with joy. The experiences we've shared with those people who've journeyed with us probably filled us with joy. And that sense of joy sometimes spills out and other people will ask us about it. And it can be a great opportunity to share something of why our faith in God is important to us. So as this new week begins, it may be good to take some time to look at our journey. Perhaps to give thanks for those people who have companioned with us along the way. To consider perhaps where God may be leading us to now. What point in this journey should we take now? Perhaps to consider who we should journey with, if there's someone else we should be getting closer to and sitting alongside as we journey together. It may be a good time to consider some fuller involvement or some ongoing involvement in a group that studies scripture together and that process of sharing our faith together can be helpful in building one another up. We're thankful to God for the ways he can speak to us through scripture, through this little story that we have shared in today. Amen. We were going to um, sing together as we continue to reflect on this theme, the song, Brother, Sister, Let Me Serve You, Let Me Be As Christ To You. We come now to our, our time of sharing concerns and notices as David comes up. Just wanted to remind you, if you haven't noticed in the notice sheet, that um, the memorial service for Walter Kappa is on this coming Saturday, the 22nd of May at 2 p.m. here in the church. Thank you. Thanks, Joy, and good morning, everyone. Um, lots of things seem to have happened or are about to happen. I don't know how many of you managed to get last night to the centre of the earth up at the Peninsula Community Theatre, but we had the Fusion annual fundraising dinner. And was it an event? There were over 20 tables of 10 people 
it really buzzed and there was a real gathering. I would say anyone who was, anyone was there <laughs> from all the churches. And uh, with the silent auction and other gifts, I know they'll get close to 20,000 from just that event. So that was a wonderful night. Um, the other success, talking of money, was that last Sunday I, I thought gently asked if you wanted to respond to the Velour appeal for funds in South India, this COVID response. We got $1,000 just at the door from your generous pockets, and that was without preparation. So thank you very much for that. There was somebody who said they wanted a, a tax deduction receipt, and I can't remember who it was. If you could come up and tell me afterwards, it's going to be difficult. Um, there's another small thing coming up this week. We're resuming our school reading program. Those of you who remember the good old days, we used to perhaps have a dozen people from St Mark's, particularly Alec Kilgour. Can I, Alec, on the screen? Um, they go down, we go down, and read to kids that are allocated, kids often with a difficulty in reading, but as the older kids, Dick and I tend to get older kids who've got a bit more than a reading problem, and it's a wonderful one-on-one -on -one connection. And it's more than made up, I think, for the lack of religious education <laughs> classes in the schools. So that's starting this week. So you could um, pray for us as we go down there. We, um, we have a, in the notices, I ought to just underline, the, is gambling your blind spot? Now you would or probably say no, never. But Australians are riddled with the gambling instinct. And we're having a special Peninsula Voice event on this Thursday night. It's uh, up at the Community Theatre again, I think, at six o'clock. There's a really interesting cast. There's Tim Costello, our recent mayor, Sam Hearn. There's a, a lady, a professor. Um, if you can find time to be there, it is event bright. You do have to... Uh, sign up beforehand, but it's free, of course. And the final thing, can I mention that we are having an interesting discussion at our home group on Wednesday with the imam of the local Muslim congregation and mosque. The, there's one in Lang Warren, if you're not familiar with it, but it's called the Ahmadiyya Group. And the imam has agreed to come and join our discussion at Liz Mackay's home. It's a couple of weeks off, but I'll just give you some notice. You can buy a clean shirt or whatever. Um, so those are my notices. Is there any others that people want to contribute from the floor? Well, let's move to our prayers, prayers of the people. <coughs> Dear God of mysterious wonder, we worship you as if you were our closest friend. We are overwhelmed by the changing seasons in the weather and the flowers and the patterns in trees and the autumn leaves. For the beauty of the earth, for the beauty of the skies, for the love that from our birth over and around us lies, Christ our God, to thee we raise this our sacrifice of praise. We acknowledge that as well as praising you, we need to praise each other. We need to affirm the generosity of other people in their giving to us of time and conversation and friendship and non-judgmental love. Help us to better get to know our neighbour next door and the church friend in the pew next to us right now. Help us to naturally give those random acts of kindness that collectively could trigger a revolution, especially in our new normal society in the post-COVID era. We thank you that the Sermon on the Mount is as old as the hills, yet just as relevant for the new society we as your kingdom people are seeking to advocate. When we take time to thank you for your acts and of generosity, we recognise there are people in our community who feel unnoticed and unaffirmed. And yet we all have a story. We all see qualities in others we would like to copy 
and affirm, help these for whom this week's budget holds a hope of improved fairness, of a better aged care, of better mental care for depression, depend, dementia, and angry frustration, and a more sustainable environment. Help us to compare our poverty with that of the millions in India and Africa and third world countries we will never see. And in seeing others in their need, do help us to engage with them and to walk with them and to give them our widow's might. And in the distribution of our new national supplies of COVID vaccine, help our government to meet the needs of countries who have not really had a fair share. Thank you for the small groups in our church community that we are part of during these days. Thank you for Carl Fass from Sydney and for his video series, Jesus the Game Changer. Thank you for the With Love to the World Bible reading notes and the value of spiritual disciplines and reflection and fasting. Thank you for the adult fellowship that has taken off again on Mondays and seems to attract a lot of new people. Thank you for the weekly musical contribution to our service of the instrumentalists and the singing group. Thank you for David Hudd's regular organ contributions and for the pianists who lead our singing on alternate weeks. And we pray for David feeling a bit unwell this morning. Thank you for Ross's reliable and essential work at the console each week. And thank you for the revival of the children's play groups and for those who give time to volunteer. And thank you for those who connect with the young people at Vale Street School and the recommencement of the reading programs there. We are grateful that someone first shared and modelled your gospel for us. And we pray especially today for those of our church family suffering pain, chronic illness, uncertainty and loneliness. And those we know personally. Be to them the great healer and spiritual hen, friend. And help us as a community of joyful faith to be an attractive demonstration of your love for everyone we meet. That we may grow in numbers and energy and service for your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' strong name and pray his prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and save us from the time of trial and the us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We are thankful for all the ways in which God has blessed us, and at this time we'd also like to acknowledge our thankfulness for the gifts that have been given to the life of the church, both those that have been given electronically and those that have been given um, through the offering today. So we're just going to take a moment to acknowledge those gifts and to acknowledge our commitment to God as well. Would you like to stand as we do that? Gracious God, we bring these gifts as symbols of our love for you and our love for one another. We pray that your blessing upon them and upon us that we may be strengthened by your Holy Spirit to be fruitful and loving witnesses to you in our world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
as we conclude our time of worship, we're going to sing together the song, Help Us Accept Each Other as Christ Accepted Us. So let us go filled with God's everlasting love, with Jesus in dwelling presence and in the renewing power of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit rest on us now and evermore. Amen.